Uh, thanks for joining our session. Uh, we would like to welcome you into the Digital Climate Smart Advisory uh, Investment Session. Um, and my name is Lisa Schrader. I'll be your moderator um, for the next 50 minutes. And uh, thanks so much for joining. Um, I'd like to just give you a quick overview of the session structure. So first we'll be introducing our, uh, our panelists um, in the, in the um, for our topic. And each one of them will give you a, a quick five minute overview of their area of expertise and their area of engagement in the field of investment in, in climate smart services. Um, and then we are going to go to you. So prepare yourself. Um, we're going to have a short poll. Uh, we'd like to know more about you and your interests. And uh, we'll gather some of that feedback and, and get a sense of the temperature in the room. And, uh, and then we'll go back to a, a, a quick discussion among the panelists uh, with a couple of, of leading questions. And then we'll come back to you. Um, and uh, hopefully we'll have about 10 minutes at the end of the session for question and answer. So we would like to encourage you to be active, uh, keep on listening, um, and, uh, and, and send us your questions in the chat. We'll be watching and we'll be organizing those for the closing discussion. Um, and so as you know, the session is being recorded. Um, and again, we're really looking forward to your feedback. This is a new stream of work for the Digital Agri Hub. Um, and we're really learning a lot from the experts and from you about what the gaps, the opportunities and the needs are in the space of climate smart investment. So um, as, you, as you know, this is a, a really nascent area in digital agriculture, but extremely critical. Um, we're understanding that there are more than 300 million small Older farmers around the world who have no access to climate smart information, but they need to be able to adapt and mitigate those impacts very, very quickly over the next five years to make a difference and be part of the, the climate change that we have to see around the world. So this is a, an area of investment that I've been looking at for the last couple of years, a lot of new companies coming in, and we need to be finding the, the, the best possible solutions and, um, and uh, lining them up for rapid scale. So this is gonna be one of the key topics um, with our experts here. And uh, let me go ahead and just uh, and introduce them. And just really quickly, Inder, would you like for me to project the slides now or will, will, uh, will the team project the slides? Okay, if, if, uh, if not, if I don't hear anything, then I'll just go ahead and project the slides myself. Here we go. All right, so I hope you can see my slides. If not, please let us know in the chat. Um, as you may know, the Digital Agri Hub is, is really positioning itself as a global hub and resource um, for ag tech providers and investors and ecosystem stakeholders um, around the world. And one of the most important areas that's emerging um, as a practice group or practice area for the Digital Agri Hub is digital climate smart advisory services. So if you go onto the website for the hub, um, you'll see some, some, uh, some resources that might be of interest, including the work around the COP side event, the COP26 side event, an insights brief and a blog post that's really drawing on, um, on insights and data that's coming from the AgriHub dashboard. And if you haven't visited the website for the AgriHub, the digital AgriHub, you'll see that there is a, an interactive map or dashboard that draws on data points from solution providers around the world and allows you to, um, to essentially kind of choose regions that you would like, specific focus areas that you would like, and to learn more about solution providers across, across the globe. Um, and we encourage you to interact with the map and uh, we're, we're constantly updating it. And, and please do um, reach out to the D Digital Agri Hub if you would like to profile your solution or if you think that there are solutions that should be included in the database. So um, with that, uh, we're, we're gathering a lot of information, we're learning a lot and um, looking forward to hearing from our experts and from you. Um, let me go ahead and, um, and introduce our panelists. Um, so first we have Victoria Close, who is the Climate Smart Agriculture and Technology Expert at the Mercy Corps AgriFin programs. Um, and I've, been, I've had the privilege of working with, uh, with Victoria for many years now uh, in, in, in Africa. Um, Victoria has 10 years of background in digital agri-tech, um, working with mobile network operators around the world. Um, she leads the Climate Smart portfolio at Mercy Corps AgriFin, and she's also worked with the GSMA, MCOPA, and many other tech leaders in the ag space over the last 10 years. So she's really a, a fantastic expert in the space and has recently been um, collecting um, landscape data on solution providers in the climate smart space uh, for East and Southern Africa. 
And um, next, I'd like to introduce Chris Wayne. And Chris Wayne is, a, um, is an associate director at Acumen, and he leads Acumen's uh, investment policies on smallholder agriculture, supporting local teams to source and structure agricultural transactions. Um, Chris joined Acumen in 2021. Um, and has been working across the Americas um, in the United States, but also in Costa Rica and, and throughout South America, looking at agricultural solutions as well. So uh, it's great on, across our panel, um, we have Africa, uh, the Americas, and then we have, um, we have John V, who I hope is on the line now, uh, John V. Um, Paprawal, who is an investor and development finance enthusiast. Um, and she is working with um, Avishkar Capital, where she's in charge of the portfolio um, related to agriculture and construction. Um, Avishkar is the, the um, she's leading the Sustainable Agriculture and Climate Change Fund, and they're managing over $450 million in assets in India. So hopefully, uh, John V, she was having trouble getting on the line. Hopefully she's with us now. Um, but we'll go ahead and we'll move into our panel introduction, and maybe I'll ask Victoria uh, to, to be our first speaker just to give a, a quick oversight of overview of her work and her background. And then we've asked each of the panelists to really kind of talk about this space. Oh, great, John VC, so you, uh, so you're, you're on board, great. Um, we're asking each of the panelists to just take a little bit of time to talk about not only their own experience, but also what they see as the opportunities, the gaps, and the real needs to accelerate climate investment in, um, in DCAS. Uh, Victoria, I'll hand it over to you. Thanks so much, Lisa, and hi, everybody. It's great to be here today. Um, Lisa's given a good introduction to who I am and what I do, but <clears throat> excuse me, for those of you who don't know AgriFin, um, it's a program run, set a uh, based out of Mercy Corps. I've been with the team for two years based in Kenya in Nairobi. Um, AgriFin's model is that with support from donors such as Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and others, we support uh, the development, the testing and the scale out of um, what we call digitally enabled services for smallholder farmers. So our model just very briefly is that we work really as an innovation partner with private sector scale partners. Um, so that could be banks, mobile network operators, agribusinesses, and tech innovators. And over the last, well, since 2015, we've completed 200 engagements with over 150 of these partners, and we've reached 8 million farmers with uh, registered services. So that gives you the background. Um, in terms of uh, the opportunities, I think um, there's so much that I could say here, but I think just obviously to start with the demand, and I think this is... This is obvious sometimes, but when you think of a smallholder farmer, they really are facing some pretty major challenges. So, I mean, just simple things like not knowing when the rain will start, you know, farmers actually need to know when to plant. So that information that we take for granted of when, when we expect the rain to come, um, that information is still really important and, and seems basic, but that's, that's still very critical. Um, and then obviously the complex needs when it comes to new pest outbreaks, um, and other um, complications that climate change is bringing. Um, I think in terms of opportunities, as we've, as Lisa mentioned, there's a huge, what we see as a huge pipeline or a, a growing landscape of exciting innovation in the kind of digital climate smart ag space. Uh, so everything from early warning alerts to yield forecasting models, um, training farmers via SMS on soil management, um, and even things like, you know, using alternative data sets around things like soil health um, to score uh, credit worthiness, for example. Um, so, yeah, just to sum up on that, I think I would say that there's a huge amount of opportunity. There's obviously some services are more mature, such as the insurance aspect. Um, but there are there is a huge gap and a huge need still to support the more early stage innovation, as well as the 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 basic information, let's say, like the DCAS when it, or digital climate advisory services that are based on weather, simple weather alerts that are linked or tied to a farmer's location. Um, so I think, yeah, just thinking about those gaps a little bit more and the, the need to promote greater kind of investment. If we think about digital climate advisory services specifically, I think there's a few areas which I would highlight. And one would be, data collection um, to make uh, what we call precision or decision agriculture a reality. So we really need to know smallholder farmers locations. We need to know what crops they're growing and when they planted those crops to then enable the models 
behind um, these climate advisory services uh, to, to be effective at a small smallholder level. Um, and then I think this, the second one is really just, we still need excellent content. We need, um, so when I say content, I mean the training materials, the actual message that a farmer will receive that will, will hopefully incentivize behavior change. So it's linking the climate data, the climate, um, all the climate knowledge that we're building up with that specific advisory that's tailored to smallholder farmers. And then finally, I think just a lot more investment and a lot more work on business models for DCAS. You know, who this, this age old question of who will pay, how can we actually make these services sustainable? Um, because they're expensive to, to set up and to build. And um, yeah, just, I think that would be my final point. Thanks, Lisa. Thank you, Victoria. It's, it's great to get the, the on the ground perspective um, from all of the companies that, that Agrofin is working with in Africa as a kickoff to the conversation. And I think we'll move now to, to Chris um, for his perspectives from Acumen. Great. Well, thanks, Lisa. And thanks, Victoria, for sort of setting the table here for me. My name is Chris Wayne. I'm, as Lisa said, the Associate Director of Investing in Agriculture, sort of a title I could never have made up as a little kid uh, with a dad as a farmer, um, but very happy to be here in the role. I get to sort of support our regional offices uh, on the development of a global ag strategy and search out, and invest in innovative business models that, that are driving impact at the center of smallholder uh, ag, poverty, and climate change, which is sort of back in mission. Uh, we're a nonprofit taking a new approach to, to problems of poverty. We have a, a pioneer model that res resembles sort of an evergreen venture fund. Uh, but with some significant differences, we, we continuously raise philanthropic capital and use it to make equity and debt investments. Um, and when we exit our stake in a company, that capital is returned to Acumen rather than to investors uh, to make new investments to cover management costs. That's our pioneer model. We do have commercial funds under a separate model. For the last 15 years, we've been working towards uh, improving smallholder incomes by investing in early stage entrepreneurs, um, agribusinesses that, that do center those smallholder farmers as customers or suppliers, average ticket size of 350K to 750K, uh, to date have deployed around $36 million in 34 agribusinesses across 11 countries uh, with a impacted lives of around 40 million. Um, in the mid 2000s, when we started our ag investing, we were, uh, we were new. Um, and our, our strategy focused primarily on sort of innovative inputs with the hypothesis being that smallholders were poor primarily because their yields from farm incomes were low. Um, while we learned that's true, there's, there's also a whole host of other sort of significant constraints on, on smallholders that keep them poor. Uh, includes things that folks have discussed already here, but uh, lack of, of credit and especially cheap credit, lack of access to markets, um, and maybe most importantly for the conversation today, lack of access to training, extension, and advisory that would sort of help them adapt to this dramatically and, and, and quickly, quickly changing climate. Um, and then to sort of achieve those desired impacts for smallholders, we needed to look at more comprehensive business models than what we were looking at before. Um, in 2021, we produced a report called Resilient Farmers um, that was in collaboration with the Busara Center and with support from FCDO, um, which interviewed 360 smallholder farmers in Ethiopia, Kenya, Nigeria, and Tanzania. Um, and learned, um, no surprise, that, that farmers are acutely aware of climate change uh, and the impacts on their farm. Um, and they know what it is, they know, they know how it's impacting them, um, and they really uh, you know, appreciate digital platforms offering both high quality inputs and access to markets, but also the sort of training and expert advice that we're talking about today. So this is a, an issue um, that's sort of, sort, sort of central to, to our ongoing strategy here at Acumen. Um, our entrepreneurs similarly are, are keenly aware of the impact climate change is having um, and, and are, are, are figuring out how to integrate training advisory into their models. Um, but they're faced with a real challenge. And I think our experience has shown that despite the valuing, um, smallholders valuing assistance and advisory, a lot of them are unwilling to pay for, stand, for, for standalone climate advisory services. Um, so what we've seen is a lot of innovation from entrepreneurs around how to integrate climate advisory into core offerings that include other products and services in sort of a bundled service approach. And we'll talk a lot more about that today. But our experience is that that bundle almost always needs to include some component of, of access to markets uh, in order to be successful, at least in our experience, which is, is limited. Um, I think 
I think it's important just for this conversation from, from a challenge perspective to, to add that behavior change is super slow. Um, farmers across the world, not this is not limited to small to farmers in developing countries, uh, are deeply hesitant to change uh, given the outsized risks they face um, in operation of their business. And, and even uh, a small on-farm behavioral change from what we've seen can take three, four, five seasons to, to be integrated and be adopted. Um, and it's only really after the value of the product or service has been sort of unequivocally proven out. So uh, this is not easy work. Um, and in our experience, it's why digital climate advisory services really shouldn't replace person-to-person -person communication, but rather play a sort of support role to on-the-ground support and extension advisory. And when, when DCAS is sort of utilized as an enabler for supporting on-the-ground services, it can drive faster adoption and more impactful outcomes. Most farmers, in our experience, are really discerning practitioners of new technology. Uh, I mean that they, they are no less capable of judging cost and benefit than any of us. Um, they live closer to the land than many of even the entrepreneurs that are servicing them building solutions. Um, so that means that building that trust with them, showing them the real value of a product is crucial to that adoption. So we definitely see a few critical gaps and I'll kind of close up here. Um, the first for us is a, is a need for more flexible financial instruments um, to meet these sort of actual capital needs. And I don't just mean the, the physical, the capital itself, but the, what, where and how that capital is applied, especially for early stage entrepreneurs. Secondly, I think it's, it's really important to develop more realistic return expectations from the investor community broadly on what these models can and can't do. We are not seeing the type of returns that are touted in many of the white papers uh, in this work. And I think it's important for us to be honest about why and what that looks like. And then finally, as a group, I think uh, this is a constant refrain here, but we need to develop context relevant and, and practical impact frameworks that we can all sort of share, deliver a consistent message out to our agribusinesses uh, and to the smallholder farmers that are filling those databases. So, so I'll leave it there, but, but thanks and, and happy to be here. Looking forward to the conversation. Thank you, Chris. Thanks so much, you and Victoria, for, for um, kicking us off well and, and, keeping, and keeping to time very efficiently. So we'll have time to talk to the audience. Um, I'll go ahead and introduce uh, John B. Um, please go ahead and introduce your organization, what you do, and what you see as the opportunities and the challenges that we're facing. Thank you so much, Lisa, and uh, thank you so much for uh, inviting me for this panel. Um, so my name is Janvi Paprival. I'm a director at Avishkar Capital, uh, and I see um, I oversee uh, investment management right from uh, deal sourcing, um, portfolio management, exits. I also lead sectoral initiatives in sustainable agriculture and climate. Um, talking about Avishkar Capital, we are an impact investing fund um, present um, uh, in India primarily um, since over two decades. Uh, focusing on India, of course, and also have expanded to Southeast Asia and Africa. Uh, we manage more than $400 million of assets, uh, have made about 70 investments across these geographies, uh, and 60 specifically within India. We have exited about 80 companies, so have a strong track record there. Um, we have completed uh, five uh, fund cycles across India right now in the process of raising a sixth India-focused fund, uh, which is targeted about $250 million. Um, we invest in um, several sectors apart from um, uh, food and agriculture, uh, there being uh, financial services, financial inclusion, as well as other sectors such as healthcare, education, and so on. But having said that, food and agriculture uh, is um, uh, very up our alley, and uh, we invest about 35 to 40 percent of our fund size in food and agriculture. Um, we are typically early to early growth stage investors, um, investing anywhere between five to about um, uh, 15 million dollars um, at uh, early stages. Um, to date, we have impacted about 10 million odd farmers through our investments uh, in the food and agriculture space. So talking further about uh, this sector and how we're looking at uh, the opportunities, um, India has about 150 million uh, farmers and 85 odd percent of them are small and uh, marginal. Um, and unfortunately, they have been victims of um, information asymmetry, uh, lack of access to um, right quality um, agricultural inputs, low mechanization, uh, low irrigation, limited uh, warehousing facilities, limited pool storage, uh, limited access to markets. And all of this has made them very vulnerable to um, uh, vagaries of nature. And uh, that uh, is only getting um, you know, exacerbated with the climate change that we're seeing around. Uh, and this uh, often leaves them with um, poor realizations, uh, low yields, 
Um, and all of these challenges present immense opportunity to digitally intervene uh, the ecosystem and offer solutions to these farmers. And also from a climate perspective, um, uh, we are seeing limited awareness and appreciation from the farmers towards uh, shifting towards uh, sustainable agricultural practices, including uh, you know, right cropping decisions, usage of uh, organic um, crop nutrition, crop protection products, and even in case of inorganic inputs, right, uh, usage of uh, the right quantities, um, right quantities of um, uh, uh, you know, water, um, uh, soil property conservation, all of these needs immense uh, awareness and education uh, among the farmers. Um, furthermore, uh, India stares at a population of about 5 billion by uh, 2050, and uh, today 30% of the population is undernourished. Uh, hence, we are uh, facing a looming crisis of water shortage, of food security, and there's an urgent pressing need to shift towards agriculture, uh, sustainable agricultural practices. So, um, so yeah, I think the opportunities are immense um, and um, uh, all of these challenges um, um, are, are being addressed by several startups. Um, and um, I think um, there are a lot of tailwinds in the sector in India. Um, agri uh, technology, the intersection of technology, capital and entrepreneurship um, along with governmental support is really um, creating a very vibrant um, uh, ecosystem for investing in the agricultural space. In fact, agri-tech is one of the hottest uh, you know, investment destinations in India today. And I really have no reason to complain. Uh, I think uh, we are at the right time uh, to bring about all the changes that we want to see in the agricultural uh, ecosystem in India. Um, so several opportunities uh, you know, uh, that we have invested in and we are evaluating from our upcoming fund um, and the Encompass um, uh, climate advisory using uh, smartphone apps, um, IoT enabled precision farming, um, soil health monitoring, irrigation, um, controlled farming, soilless, vertical, uh, tech enabled market linkages, uh, digital marketplaces, um, tech enabled aggregation logistics. Uh, we're also seeing um, um, uh, micro warehousing, uh, food brands centered around superfoods, uh, you know, having uh, direct linkages with the farmers. Um, and finally, lending uh, with the rich quality of data that a lot of these startups are producing. It's enabling um, uh, lenders to uh, penetrate into the hinterlands of the country where, uh, where farmers have limited access to quality. Uh, cheap finance um, and and several of these initiatives are uh, supporting um, credit underwriting. Um, and I think challenges continue to be uh, um, in the sector. I think um, uh, for for investors, um, I, I think some of the challenges that uh, one needs to be uh, aware of. Uh, while while I said that you know the sector is extremely lucrative for uh, you know investing uh, in the startups in India today, uh, but um, uh, there is limited understanding about um, the agricultural sector uh, even among the investors, right? Uh, uh, because one can do only this much of secondary research, uh, you know, being in um, the financial hubs of Mumbai, Bangalore, and Gurgaon, whereas you know the end consumers of fisheries are far far. Um, and hence, uh, you know, uh, understanding the nuances of um, um, the farmer's uh, psyche, uh, their ability to pay, um, you know, how they're able to trust the startups, uh, given that they've been for a very, very long time, uh, you know, the receiving end of several mad practices um, uh, in the ecosystem and, you know, being um, at the mercy of uh, climate changes. Uh, it's, it's, it's a challenge uh, getting right there on the ground uh, and uh, creating solutions for farmers for which they are uh, willing, to, willing to pay. I think these are some of the challenges that are very critical for the ecosystem to follow grow. So I'll stop there and, um, and uh, you know, allow you to take charge, Lisa. <laughs> Thanks so much, John B. I, I was on a, a, a webinar with the World Bank and, and the Indian tech community um, last week that really, or maybe it was earlier this week, um, that really amazed me in terms of the scale um, that you're reaching in, in India. Um, and so it's, it's interesting to hear that it's the hottest thing, that it's the hottest thing out there. And I think that's really encouraging. Um, how we can make that all work for climate is really the challenge we want to address ourselves to. And I think right now what we'll do is we'll, we'll go to um, our poll. 
um, we'd like to hear from you. Um, there are going to be three questions, and uh, my colleague Ender is going to be is going to be um, putting them up so that you can vote. They're multiple choice. Each there are three questions, multiple choice, and you can click the all that apply. Um, and then we'll we'll get some information back from you. And I realize not everybody on the panel or in the audience is an investor. Um, so please, if you are uh, if you are an organization seeking investment or another type of ecosystem, just flip it. Uh, flip the question to where they're most relevant to you. What are the what are the key key needs for you, um, and the key gaps for you? So, um, Inder, uh, why don't you go ahead and get the poll rolling? Okay, breakout poll one. Uh, what are the most interesting climate investment targets for you? This is multiple choice, so you can choose all that apply. Is it digital climate, uh, climate advisory services or things like post-harvest loss, where I know John B. has a lot of experience, insurance, carbon credits, or other? Um, please check all that apply. Um, and uh, the host and panelists can't vote. Um, and then the second question is, what are the critical information? What's what is the critical information you need to increase climate investments for small scale producers? Proven climate impact solution? Do you need scale of outreach? Do you need location data? More information about the the location that you're working in? More farm data? Do you need more information about the financial performance of these solutions or other? And then the last question is, what do you need to learn more about? And I thought it was interesting that John B. said, not everyone knows about ag. And you know that's, that's amplified by the fact that not everyone knows about climate. We're all learning about climate now. So what do you need to know more about? Localized climate solution, uh, digital climate advisory services, and the providers, or digital climate smart advisory business models, government supporting government activities and roles. I think those are some of the tailwinds that maybe John V was talking about. That's helpful. What are the optimal bundles of climate and other services? And then just hit other if there's something else. Just go ahead and, and click all that apply and then we'll we'll have a look and see what you think. We need like some of that great music from one of the game shows. <laughs> Inder, just let us know when when you're ready to when you're ready to uh, put up the screen. And just want to encourage people once you've uh, you know once you've answered the poll, please feel free to share any questions that you might have. Um, I know there was one question that came through for Victoria. Um, about the nature of, of whether uh, Agrofin works with um, the Met departments. Do you want to, Victoria, do you want to answer that one just while we're waiting? Yeah, thanks, Lisa. I actually responded in the chat. Um, it was quite a, a really interesting question, actually, something um, that I'd like to follow up with the, the, um, the person that posed the question. Um, yeah, so I've responded to it, but happy to... Um, to touch on that, I mean, I think the question was really around um, have we worked with uh, kind of, well, let me get it up quickly while everybody's filling out the, uh, do most of course support production side and producer user interface platforms. So for example, participatory scenario planning of climate services. Um, I mean, we have done a lot of work with, um, for example, in Kenya with Calro, um, who work closely with the Met Department in Kenya, for example. Um, and again, obviously with, in Ethiopia, we've worked with um, ATA, who have close ties with you know, the, the National Met Departments. But um, I think this question is really interesting, thinking about this participatory scenario planning. So I'd love to, to follow up with you and Jockey. Thank you. Okay. Thanks a lot, Victoria. And let's look and see what we've learned. Um, so what are the most interesting climate investment targets? Okay, so we're leading off with, uh, with Digital Climate Smart Advisory itself, um, tied with post-harvest loss. Um, very interesting. I mean, I think there, there's climate advisory and there are also, there are also actually like climate smart services like post-harvest loss bags or silos. Um, insurance um, is of interest. Carbon credits, definitely of interest. I know that this is something we're all really looking at is how can we help small scale producers uh, participate in carbon credit markets and really have the incentives and the payout that will make a difference for the millions and millions of acres um, under cultivation by small scale producers. And then 9% other, so the mystery other. Um, let me go ahead and go to the second one. Um, what is the critical information you need to increase climate investments? 
Um, and so again, here we're looking at outreach to farmers. That's interesting. Um, and then uh, it looks like oh, oh, actually, it looks like farm data is the most important. And this and this is this makes a lot of sense if you if you want to be climate smart, um, you actually need to know quite a bit about the the local context and the specific farms that you're working with. So location data. I know at Agrofin we're working with a lot of governments and, and different partners to geotag um, farmers so we can get that farm data, get that location data. Um, but it looks like outreach is important. A lot of these um, solutions are very, very small. Uh, proven climate impact is still early, early days and financial performance. Um, let's look at number three. What do you need to learn more about? Local uh, looks like a lot of learning. Um, it looks like it's concentrated mainly around localized climate solutions. So what's out there? That's a, a great objective of the Digital Agri Hub is to get the climate solution information up on the dashboard. Um, and then uh, business models, we're going to be talking about that in a minute and optimized bundles. So, okay, great. This sounds, this makes a lot of sense. Um, any immediate response from our panelists about the areas of interest? Anything resonate for you? I think um, no surprise that we're in the deep. <laughs> good. It's always good when two people answer at the same time. Um, go ahead, uh, John V. Maybe you ladies first. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, no, there was one point on governmental support. Um, so you know, while there are tailwinds with the um, you know, government coming up with policies that are favorable for agriculture and smallholder farmers, um, we tend to avoid investing in uh, startups that uh, are dependent on uh, government policies or you know, the favorable outcomes um, because um, uh, we, we really don't want to uh, risk our investments with changing, probably changing government policies. So I just wanted to uh, make that note here. Okay, great. And Chris, what was your point? Um, a great point, John B. I, I, um, I think I was just gonna add in that um, the inherent localness of agriculture um, and the need for that jumped, that jumped out to me is the need for highly contextualized information going out to smallholder farmers and some of our earlier investments str struggled with that in, in providing specifically weather related data that was that was uh, hyper specific hyper local in a way that actually impacted the farm that way so that definitely jumped out. Okay, very good and Victoria any other observations anything resonate from you from the feedback from the audience. Yeah, I was just happy to see the first two in the first poll of the, the most interesting ones being the carbon credit, um, yeah, carbon credits and post harvest loss. So, um, yeah, just wanted to note that. But yeah, I think uh, those are two big opportunity areas with different challenges, of course. Okay, great. Well, we've got, um, we'll move into now the, uh, some questions for the panel, and then, um, which, which I'll moderate, and then we'll move into Q&A from the audience who still have time to send through more questions. Um, and again, we're just looking at opportunities, challenges, and needs uh, for investment um, in the climate smart space. Um, so one of the things that uh, that obviously is super important for investment um, is is the business model itself. So I have a question to the group, particularly to Chris and Victoria. I know we talked about this earlier about what are the emerging individual business models that can sustainably drive digital climate advisory services. They're they're difficult um, to make profitable in and of themselves. And what can we learn from investment challenges and failures from the past? And maybe I'll I'll ask Chris to speak to this first. Sure, um, and I'll I'll put a disclaimer on this that we've we've made a few investments in the space, but we're we're in no way experts in the space. So I'll be interested to hear what the what the audience and the rest of my panelists have to say. Um, and I'll also point out that you know we focus uh, almost exclusively on smallholder farmers, two hectares or less, often living below or at the poverty line. So our we we work with entrepreneurs, but their focus uh, in order to sort of pass our investment criteria is that they focus. Uh, on smallholder farmers, um, commercial inclined smallholder farmers, but but very much uh, bottom of the pyramid we're talking about here. So um, I'd say early in our ag investing, this is back in the mid 2000s um, through mid 2010s, we, we invested in a few pure, pure, kind of pure play B2C digital advisory extension models. Um, two of the investments that started as B2C eventually evolved into the B2B or Business to government or institution, um, primarily due to the to the to the difficulty in getting farmers to pay even a, a small weekly or monthly fee uh, for a pure play digital agriculture or, or digital climate advisory service. Um, certainly recognize that there are successful. Um, 
um, models in that space, uh, and I don't want to discredit them, but they, they were not successful for us. Um, we also recognize that they were they're successful sort of beta I and BDG models out there in, in Acre Africa, in ECX. Um, those are two that come to mind right away. But um, in the B2G space specifically, our, our investees struggled with those models because government contracts traditionally are slow, very lumpy, and, and often late, which can be a real struggle for working capital and cash flows within small businesses that way. So um, that was a sort of a big early learning for us. Um, so uh, in, in some of the other kind of problem and issue areas, failure points really, uh, as I mentioned before, some of the products and services were really not well tailored to the audience. There was feedback from farmers and some of our early investees that specifically the weather advisory services were not appropriately localized. I just mentioned that, but also that they only included a single day's weather um, included in the advisory, limiting sort of the ability for a smallholder to farm. So I, I think that technology is dramatically improved, um, but that it, early on, that was sort of an issue for smallholders seeing a value there. Um, and yeah, now we're looking really at how DCAS can be integrated into sort of these larger bundles of services um, for smallholders. And, and I think it's a difficult decision for, for, for businesses here. Um, they sort of have three options. They can, they can integrate the cost of DCAS into a revenue model that's managed often by sort of achieving a significant, inc significant enough increase in, in product quality or volume that results in a premium sufficient to cover the cost of those services. And that's probably the most sustainable model. In others, and I think John B spoke to this a little bit, they utilize or depend on partnerships with NGOs or governments to sort of provide those services uh, through, through, through key partnerships. And in other cases, they're just dependent on philanthropy or government support to sort of capital to sort of subsidize the cost there. So um, I think, I think that's sort of a, an overlay of, of what we've seen. There are models that are making this work. Um, the, the, I think the jury is still out on how to actually fund and support them. And I think it brings up larger questions of who other stakeholders may need to be in this space to make it be successful going forward, but I'll leave it there. That's great. Thanks so much, Chris. Um, I think that really resonates. Um, Victoria, is there anything else you'd like to say on that point? I know it's an area where you engage a lot. Yeah, I think um, just on the, the point around the kind of emerging business models um, to try and get past this issue of who pays when it comes to DCAS. And I think um, the point you raised, um, Chris, around the bundles, I think bundles are, tried, you know, are proven, I would say now, you know, that bundling in the information with um, a host of other services is, is what farmers prefer and therefore drives greater sustainability. But I think what's interesting to think about as well with DCAS and, and trying to shift behavior is um, what, what kind of incentives can you put in that bundle? So can you tie, um, you know, rather than a farmer waiting till the end of the year for the carbon credit payout, for example, in the current um, way that it is structured, is can you front load the incentives with, um, you know, free soil tests or whatever else it might be that's you know will then kind of make that bundle more effective if you like and therefore whoever you know the, the cost of the decast can be shared across um all the the bundle partners so that was something that i think is we're starting to hear a bit more about that and then on the second point um really around the localization which you, you raised and that's often why the the weather information services or or many of the kind of <clears throat> advisory services in general for farmers have have not succeeded is that then just not relevant enough for a farmer to act on and so I think this this model of using agents out in the field you know building up these um, agripreneur or village-based advisor or rural agent models where the agents can actually you know be equipped with a smartphone be effectively trained to provide that really localized um, you know digital climate advice uh, and so I think building up those agents is, is potentially an easier way to overcome that barrier of how do we get location data from farmers at scale? How do we ask them when they planted, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, I think those are two hopefully exciting new or kind of emerging areas in the, in the business model around DCAS. Thanks, Victoria. I think, I think that's a larger question for us all to be thinking about is how DCAS can be bundled in with other services um, to be scalable, to be relevant, to be adopted, et cetera. Maybe I can um, hand that one over to John V for her perspective. And there was also an interesting question from the um, um, from the from the audience that maybe I can mix in there for John V. Um, pitch you two questions at the same time. Um, one of them was um, that there is a lot of decast activity 
um, that's either very early stage or just stuck in small scale, stuck in a small scale trap. Um, as I said, in India, you know, it, it's really kind of amazing. I mean, you look at like Dehat with 600,000 farmers on it. I mean, we've worked with DigiFarm in, in Kenya with 1.3 million registered farmers, but getting to the scale drivers, bundling, finding the optimal um, bundle and really driving scale is where we need to go. So love to hear your perspective on, on those two questions from the group. Uh, thanks, Lisa. And um, uh, I agree, both these questions are quite interrelated. Um, so bundling of solutions, I think, is not really um, an option going forward for companies to scale uh, because um, solving for um, farmers' problems, um, uh, I mean, if, if one is focused on, on just, say, uh, inputs or advisory, uh, you're not really solving all of the farmers' problems, and they would have to uh, look out for other alternatives for solving their other problems, uh, such as market linkages, um, access to credit, and so on and so forth. Um, through our investments, um, specifically in Agustar, in Argos, uh, we have seen these companies evolve their business models. Um, Agustar had started off in 2013 um, as uh, advisory and uh, providing agricultural inputs uh, directly to the farmers. Uh, over time, they have um, uh, they have digitized their offerings uh, from a mobile phone, uh, sorry, from a, uh, a telecalling sort of a um, uh, solution. They moved to a mobile smartphone app-based solution. Um, um, started offering this this services um, through um, uh, an Amazon sort of a marketplace, as well as a Facebook that sort of a you know, social networking platform where farmers can interact with each other and also get uh, responses to their queries in real time. Um, Moving forward, the company would also get into the output linkages uh, where farmers can get access to, um, uh, to uh, food processors um, uh, and also get access to credit going forward. So a company that was, uh, uh, that was you know, solving for, uh, say, input and, um, um, and, and um, maybe weather-related um, uh, information and other uh, services has gotten into multiple, multiple areas. Um, likewise, Argos, which uh, is a micro warehousing company, um, uh, has also started offering credit uh, on uh, warehousing receipts, has also started offering uh, market linkages to the farmers. So this is a need uh, of the farmer, and it's also an opportunity for the startup to uh, expand their um, uh, their services, expand their revenue, reduce their customer acquisition costs, uh, improve their margins and profitability. Um, but another challenge to the scale is the fact that agricultural solutions are not 100% tech. Uh, these are um, often supported by on-ground resources. As Victoria rightly pointed out, that there is a need for agripreneurs who could, you know, uh, liaise with farmers, uh, who could provide ground truthing uh, abilities, uh, you know, to triangulate the data that one gathers from satellite or um, IoT, etc. Um, there is logistics involved if you are you know, providing input and market linkages, and um, there are field service officers if you are providing credit. Um, and hence, um, uh, rapid scaling of these startups is challenging. There is physicality, there is a physical, uh, a huge physical presence um, element out here. Um, uh, but having said that, uh, I'm really happy to see several startups in India uh, scaling very, very rapidly. The heart is growing nearly 100%. And year on year, AgroStar, Argos, they're growing at 100, 200 um, percent. And, um, and um, um, so, so, yeah, I mean, bundling of services um, along with uh, physical touch points um, is a challenge and an opportunity both. both. Great, thank you. Um, we're getting more great questions from the panel, uh, the, from the panelists, and we're just told we have an extra five minutes, um, which is awesome. Um, so one of the tough questions that just came through was, bundling sounds great, but tell me about which solution providers that you know of have done this in a way that's profitable. Um, and so I'll throw that across to all of you guys. Um, who do you know in your universes that's that's been profitably doing this? And um, I'll let you guys think about that for a second. And, and just, you know, from my experience, I'll, I'll, I know that um, one that we that we really have been impressed with over the years, um, because I've been working with Victoria over at Agrifin as well, um, is Pula uh, that does crop insurance and has 
you know, is, a, is an insurance provider, but basically has realized that in order to sell insurance, it's got to be bundled with inputs. It's got to be bundled with financial services. It's got to be bundled with advisory services. Those guys have even bundled into tractor services. Um, so, you know, one thing that, and, and Pula is now officially, is officially profitable, um, which I never would have dreamed of if someone asked me seven years ago, was like, which of your tech partners is going to be, I never would have dreamed it would be an insurance provider. Um, but I think that they have used um, bundling in a way that's been very responsive to each country context that they work in. And, um, and every context, context is, is different. Like we've, we've seen them work in Zambia with government and Nigeria with tractor providers and Kenya with World Food Program. So, you know, it really, the bundling question is not, um, um, you know, I'm the moderator. I'm not supposed to answer these questions, but I just thought I'd get in there and <laughs> throw in the first one. Who would like to go next of, of you know, a concrete service that's really climate smart and is, is becoming profitable and, and leveraging bundles? Who would just raise your hand if you want to go? Okay, go ahead, John B. Oh, I saw Chris unmute himself, so I'd allow him to take it first this time. It's all you, John B. Go ahead. I'll follow after. Okay, thanks again. Um, so I can talk about AgroStar, um, um, which I just talked about. Uh, they were in the input space and um, ad advisory and um, you know, moved to digital app. Um, so happy to share that they are um, that uh, they are pretty good on gross margin. Uh, and, and, and like you said, Lisa, it was very hard to imagine them uh, being turning profitable a few years back. Uh, but with the right interventions um, across um, uh, their offerings, uh, with rapid scaling and bundling, uh, they've been able to achieve these numbers. Um, our GOS as well is on the pathway to uh, profitability. In fact, um, at a limited scale, uh, they were uh, they were far more profitable with, with the kind of uh, ambitious growth that they have embarked upon. Uh, they've been burning, uh, but at an operating level, they are positive. So happy to share these two examples with you. Go ahead, Chris. Well, those are great examples, and I think uh, pathway to profitability is a is a helpful way to frame this. I, I I'm going to point to um, well, I'll, I'll give you the framework. We think about um, smallholder farmers needing six primary things in order to run functional, uh, profitable, and climate resilient farm businesses. Those are inputs, infrastructure, and equipment, um, markets, financing, technical assistance, and land. Um, and we're seeing more and more that our investments are actually covering four or five, if not all six of the different gaps necessary to fill those blanks. That's sort of part of our theory of change and investment thesis here. Um, I'll point to an investment in, in India called Kapi, which is a greenhouse in a box program. Um, the founders there came up with a really innovative, super cheap, smaller scale greenhouse. Um, as their core offering, but recognized very early on that in order to be successful in that, they needed to bundle together financing for that in partnership with uh, microfinance institutions and other small banks. They needed to provide great access to high quality inputs in order for the, uh, the product to grow well and the greenhouse, they needed um, the technical assistance and ed crop advisory for people transitioning from field agriculture into high tunnel or greenhouse agriculture. Um, and then they needed market offtake was kind of the big closing piece here. And that was a, a major goal for them. But so something that started out just as a sort of infrastructure and equipment play ended up being a massive sort of multi bundled service recognizing that all those gaps existed for smallholder farmers in that space. Uh, that's a 2019 investment. They've shown great profit margin growth and EBITDA growth over the last three years years. I think the profitability, uh, I'll still stay, is outstanding. Um, I think we want to see a couple more years of growth, but it's been an early sign and a, an early grower that we're really excited about in India. Great. And Victoria, would you would you have a, a, an example you'd like to bring forward? I think just one thing I wanted to, to add on this, because it's a tough question that, to be honest, there really aren't that many. Um, I guess, but I think what, what we've seen is, you know, when organizations come in and are really, you know, passionate about wanting to work with smallholder farmers, but are not necessarily finding organized groups of smallholders, I think, um, you know, their kind of core business or their focus tends to move away because they realize it's tough and they move to kind of like, you know, organized farmer groups uh, or, or more commercial farms. And I think, I just think that something around how they can make it work, you know, how they can prove the 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 um, the value for those types of organisations. How can that kind of be applied back to uh, to kind of make this 
more sellable, I guess, at the smallholder or more disorganized smallholder level, or, or maybe that's just, yeah, just something to note on the side. And, and maybe maybe that point leads into you know the, an interesting area that we wanted to explore about blended finance, um, you know because when you started talking Victoria I was thinking a lot about uh, Sun Culture you know who provides uh, solar irrigation with Internet of Things capabilities so that the solar pump drives the, the irrigation but also provides you know business analytics and protects water table etc. Um, and that and they're they're very close to sustainability but they rely on a blended finance model. Um, particularly to drive research and development, and I wonder um, what John V and and, uh, and Chris think about about the importance or, or or how blended finance is relevant in this space right now. Would either one of you? Yeah, go ahead, Chris. I'm gonna say, Giovanni, you should you should take that for sure. Go right ahead. Um, honestly, um, yeah, with, with regards to um, ag tech, it's, it's still quite a nascent uh, space in India. Uh, we are seeing a lot of um, equity investments flowing in, uh, but blended finance is, is not something we've seen uh, catch up uh, in the Indian ecosystem yet. Um, so I'd limit my comments to there. Anything you'd want to yeah. add, Chris? Go ahead. Just uh, you know, I think I think we, we've 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 I, I think my key point back to sort of innovative financial instruments is important, and then where the funding is coming from is critical. I think Acumen has made some of the first equity investments in a lot of the businesses we serve, but uses convertible debt, which often is just equity again um, to to assist. I think we're seeing proliferation of of innovative and less paperwork, frankly, uh, instruments like safes uh, and various other. Um, sort of creative capital matching uh, needs uh, coming up in, in this space now. Um, and that frankly, our philanthropy backed financing model here is critical sort of the sort of the market return expectations plus the risk combination that we're going with here. So we're we're at Acumen trying to combine the financial rigor of, 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 of private markets with the transparency and flexibility of philanthropic capital. So I'll leave it there. Okay, great. Well, I think it falls to me now to just um, give a minute of, summer, of, of, of summary and summary thought, um, and then we'll go ahead and move back to the main panel. Um, and, you know, I think that, uh, you know, where we landed here was a point that Chris made from the very beginning that we still really um, need uh, flexible uh, financing mechanisms. Um, and we need to possibly be thinking about more realistic returns, but um, also hearing from John V that there are organizations punching through to scale um, and that bundling and, and meeting multiple farmer needs um, is, is going to be a critical pillar of making all of that happen. And, you know, frankly, it's really, really nice to, to, to work with investors and hear investor voice that is so, um, is so focused on the, on the farmers. Um, and what the farmer's needs are. In order for uh, DCAS to work, it does have to be hyper-local. Um, you know, really interesting to hear about Chris and Victoria's experience of farmer frustration um, when the tech doesn't work for them, when it doesn't really, it, it, we're, we're really gonna have to push ourselves to make sure that this is tailored, um, to make sure that it helps drive behavior change. Um, there's a role for digital, but there's also still, as I think everybody was agreeing, a very, very important role for boots on the ground. Um, one of the things that, uh, that the, one of the questions that came through from the, um, um, from the group was, hey, wow, Busara did some research. Can we see it? Um, and so this is just to maybe finish the summary here. It's the, it's the role of the digital agri-hub to begin to, to you know, figure out what these gaps are and to, and to create resources and transparency on solutions. What I heard from the audience was that they need more information about impact. They need more information about solutions, things that work, bundles that work. Um, so this is, this is great information. We wanna thank the panelists so much um, and thank the audience for contributing this in. And, um, and I'm, I'm sure the Digital Agri-Hub will be taking it into consideration um, in the next strategic phase of the dashboard. Please keep your eye on it and do participate. Um, and I think with that, we're right on time and uh, they'll be moving us into the main, um, into the main plenary. Um, and it says, we kindly request everyone to return to the main session for closing remarks. Okay, um, and so I, I imagine, so, uh, Inder, just since you're giving us instructions, do they need to do anything specifically or will this just end and they'll be carried over naturally? Okay.
you can, let's see, leave this session and join the other session. Okay, so you need to go ahead and, and effectively leave this session and then that will carry you over to the other. Again, thank you so much to the group. Thank you to the panelists. Thank you, Chris, John B, Victoria, Thanks, and the organizers. We really appreciate this, this chance for the discussion.